All right, here. How many people do we have? Way more than my summary can easily count. Can I get some th thumbs up if people are hearing me? Hearing you. Okay, yeah. Excellent. Just want to make sure. I hear you. Sure, we can keep the mutes on. Uh, you haven't played yet. Whoa. Yes, I can hear you. Excellent. Where the hell is the mute all? You can mute everybody. <clears throat> I do need everyone to keep their mutes on, and I'm not finding my mute all button all of a sudden. Excellent. But I should still be speaking. Okay, it is just afternoon central time. Um, got a few things we want to get through. Uh, first of all, I have a chat box set up here. Uh, seems to be a little bit different when I'm doing a mass meeting than it usually is, but um, if you have questions, Hopefully you're all seeing that. Uh, again, a couple of thumbs up if you aren't. They don't have any options other than thumbs up. Excellent. Um, okay, there's gonna be a bit of stuff here. This is going to be in part how to get informa information out of the paleobiology database. It's going to be in part a little bit about Rev Bayes and other Bayesian programs. Has it's covering a lot of stuff, a lot of broad things. It's probably going to be an, in part an unsatisfactory description of all of them. But what I want to do is show you how you can use information from the PaleoDB to get started with the chronostratigraphic parameters that you're going to need to execute um, Markov chain Monte Carlo analyses with a type of birth death sampling model called the fossilized birth death process. Um, and it's going to focus more on the PaleoDB at the outset, and it'll sort of phase it. There's going to be a, a port, part in the middle where I'll be using R to access the API, and I'm going to introduce you to those in a moment, uh, to get the relevant information from Nexus, basically to take Nexus files where you have phylogenetic information or character data, get the relevant data from the PaleoDB that you want, and then 
uh, start to set up the basic scripts that you want to execute for Rev Beige, which is one of the programs that's out there that um, will let you do Bayesian phylogenetic analyses with first and last occurrence data being used to help set the priors on trees as you go. And I'll explain a bit more of this in you know, some detail um, as, as we go along. If you do have questions, put them into that little uh, chat box that I just keyed up for everyone, and I will try to get to them. I've tried to anticipate some questions, so I've got some sort of examples of how to do things uh, as we go along. It, you know, aside from, I'm gonna give you one nice and easy, everything works perfectly example, knock on wood, and then show you a few situations where um, you might want to do things a little bit differently for a variety of reasons. So to get started, there have been prior tutorials, webinars on how to use the PaleoDB, how to enter the data, how to download the data. I don't think that they went through the API in much detail. So I'm just going to, um, and also there are probably a lot of people here who haven't seen those. The R programs that I'm using and it that you might have downloaded from, from GitHub are going to rely on these. And if you go to the PaleoDB website, they have a data services documentation. And there's a whole, basically anything that you can download using sort of their main download page over here, you can get through these API. And the advantage of this is within programming languages like R, and actually you can uh, do this in, in Java and C, et cetera, if you, um, if you know how to do it. Uh, a little trickier than it is in R, R tends to make things a little easier. But the nice thing is you can download the information on the fly and it goes straight into your computer. So you're not getting these big files that you have to sort of look through and deal with by hand. Um, now, I'll emphasize one of the points I really want to emphasize, you're going to want to at one point go through some of the stuff by hand and it's going to be set up for you to sort of do that for vetting purposes. But um, the most important ones for our purposes here are going to be the API involving fossil occurrences. And there is a lot of different information that we have when you download fossil occurrences. Uh, the way the particular programs I have uh, set up work is it's pretty bare minimum. What you're gonna get is the information about the occurrences. And again, um, for those of you who are perhaps coming more from the phylogenetics background than the uh, paleontological one, uh, all an occurrence represents is the presence of a particular taxon at a or in a particular fossiliferous assemblage. It's one of the species you find there. It is closest to the concept of occupancy in ecology. It's the fact something is there. Uh, what a collection is can vary quite a bit at the finest level, sometimes like millimeter level scales through rocks where they're telling you all the different things that are there. Um, sometimes it's a more general area. And of course, it's gonna be dependent on the taxa. As you can imagine, when you're looking at like little forams, you can look at the millimeter, millimeter by millimeter. When you have a dead T-Rex, that itself takes up several meters on its own. Um, one important thing, if you are not used to playing with the fossil data, one important thing to learn is there's no such thing as the fossil record. There are a lot of different types of fossil records. Um, the examples I'm going to be presenting you with, well, two of them are dealing with Paleozoic inverts, which I know well, and which could be considered to have you know, good fossil records. Um, if I have a chance, I'll get one with plants because Mark Ewan told me there were a bunch of paleobotanists signed on. Um, they have kind of a wonky record in my mind, but I study snails, so of course I'm gonna think that. So anyways, there's a lot of different types of information you get about the occurrences. We're going to focus on the collections and the taxa that are there. The collections, on the other hand, have also have a ton of information. It's going to be extremely useful for doing things like getting first and last appearance dates. Um, this will include you know, information about the particular rock units, uh, sometimes a lot of information about particular rock sections, sometimes with these nice fossiliferous assemblages. And as I said, people will go through, you know, millimeter by millimeter sometimes, sometimes millimeter by meter, but where you're getting numerous individual collections out of one section of rock. And there's information about which particular beds 
occur above others. There's information about uh, paleo environment from as general to whether it's terrestrial or marine, or actually we don't even know, to much more specific descriptions of the physical environment and the particular depositional area. Uh, there is information sometimes about radiometric dates, although those are relatively few and far between. And for those of you who aren't as familiar with um, fossil data, one of the things I'll be emphasizing is um, how we get the general dates in those 99.9 .9 cases out of 100 where we don't have radiometric dates. And it's actually even more than that. But the important thing to note is there are a whole bunch of different fields and parameters. If you want to take the code that I provide and sort of start playing with in terms of what happens, um, one thing to keep in mind is that ultimately, it's going to access a URL that's going to be, say, identical to what I have here. And this is going to be the example we're focusing on a group of Cambrian echinoderms called the Syncta. And um, basically, we use this uh, at the short course in, uh, where the hell was it, Phoenix last year. Uh, we were doing a short course on Bayesian phylogenetics, and we focused on this one particular group, one Side effect of that is I got everything ready in the paleobiology database for the analyses. So it's a good sort of test group um, to run with. But this is a situation where we're gonna get all the collections from the Syncta from the Cambrian. Of course, we could ask for the, they don't exist outside the Cambrian. We could ask for it outside. It'll give us uh, locality information like coordinates, paleo locality information, which is gonna be the reconstructed paleo coordinates for it. Um, information about the time bins, the stratigraphy, the particular rock units, et cetera, et cetera. Now you can get most of these things with the occurrences if you want, but um, in a large proportion of cases, particularly when you're dealing with things like marine invertebrates, you're getting lots of species from individual collections. Uh, that means a lot of redundancy when you get all 75 brachiopods from one collection and you just repeat that information over and over again. Usually it's a lot easier to say, okay, it's from this collection, and we'll just basically do a lookup of some sort to jump over and see, um, you know, basically what are the attributes of that collection. Seems like I have an almost 12 year old, turns 12 tomorrow, making noise upstairs. Oh no, wait, that's a cat. They kind of sound alike. <coughs> Sorry about that. Anyways, uh, the reason why this is important is with so many of these things, the way you're really going to learn this best is, you know, not by sitting through some webinar, which will tell you about it, but actually like taking code such as I have in those R packages and playing with it yourself, um, mixing and mashing things, see what causes the blow up, see what other tricks there are for getting information that you might want. Now, why do we want to do this anyways? I'm going to give you sort of a brief description on what we're going to be using this first and last appearance data for. Again, this is, um, you know, something that'd be more appropriate for a phylogenetics course. Uh, there are quite a few things that happen with red bays and beasts and what, that will explain this. Although oftentimes it's done from the perspective of non-paleontologists. So you're going to hear a, a paleo person's point of view on this. Uh, when we are looking at phylogenies in most of the, in the modern programs, ooh, that sounds pretty pejorative calling the modern. Anyways, in likelihood and Bayesian context, we're not worried just about cladistic relationships, i.e. who is more closely related to who. Uh, we're looking at full phylogenies, and that includes things like divergence times. And one thing that is implicit to a divergence time is basically some branch duration. Sometimes it's called the branch length. I prefer to use the term branch duration because branch length is also used for the expected amount of change along a branch. Those two are intimately related, even without clocks, but just to keep it separate, I'm gonna use the term branch duration for the time. And a particular phylogeny is always going to include this. And one important thing to keep in mind is that we can keep the cladistic topology the same if we move this divergence state up and down between these two hypothetical species. And you know, here's a case where we have one species found three times over this range. Um, for those of you who are coming perhaps from more of the phylogenetics background, in the paleo world, old is down, new is up, um, old is to the left, young is to the right. Uh, it's often drawn actually the opposite of that in both ways in the neontological literature. Uh, and neontologists is what we call those of you who aren't paleontologists. Anyways, so 
this is going to be kind of important because this is going to affect the priors on the trees in two different ways. First of all, and this gets back to information that there was or uh, aspect of the phylogenies that was widely discussed in the 90s. You have to miss all the predecessors for both species um, along these you know, orange lines here. And the predecessors could be earlier members of the species. Uh, they could be the direct ancestors, the parents, if you will, the grandparents, great grandparents, doesn't really matter. Um, you're definitely missing those. We also have to be missing any close relatives. And this is an aspect that wasn't in most of the earlier papers about, say, strata likelihood and strata cladistics. Uh, Mike Foote and company first started using this um, in a 1999 paper. It's been much more thoroughly developed in recent years. I would refer you to a paper by David Baps in 2013 in uh, MEE, uh, in which I think David really comes up with the, the best summary of this because when it comes down to the parameters involved, Missing earlier members of a species, the direct ancestors, the grandparents, etc., is a question purely of sampling. It's just a probability of zero finds given some expected number. It can be done in a Poisson system or it can be done in a binomial system if you have an idea of the number of localities. That's something which the paleo DB is very good, by the way. Uh, missing the close relatives is a little trickier because it reflects sampling in part, but what's also going to be important are the origination rates because origination rates, platogenesis rates in particular is what we're really talking about here, that's going to give you the expected number of sort of side branches. But here's the kicker, right? We're not worried just about missing sort of the immediate ant or great ant taxon. We're also going to be worried about all of the cousins and the cousins once removed and the cousins twice removed. In other words, all of the possible progeny. So what we need to be missing is a clade of unknown size. And this is gonna be dependent on the sampling rate, but the origination and the extinction rates. As the origination rates go up, we expect more cousins and therefore more total evolutionary time that we have to miss. Conversely, as extinction rates go up, individuals are gonna have shorter lifespans. Uh, it's gonna be easier for them to go extinct without issue higher extinctions will decrease the probability of this. And of course, increasing sampling will increase it as well. So this is sort of an additional aspect. And what this means is that the diversification parameters are going to become very important. Um, and this is the information that we're going to be trying to extract from the paleo DB. So what I'm gonna do is um, uh, run through some examples for you. The current setup for this is really focused on, let's see, here we are. just first and last appearance data. Uh, this is an example from the Rev Bayes tutorial in which they present a combined analysis for bears, in which they are able to combine molecular and morphologic data and in including morphologic data for extinct bear species. And the information that they're asking for is just the age uh, of the species. And what this includes is, in this case, basically the lower and upper bounds, again, because they're coming from the neontological world, they write it backwards relative to the way paleontologists would write it. But the important thing is, um, these are when these taxa would have been, been present. And the importance of this is they're going to restrict the uh, possible divergences of clades, but also the morphology is going to be important because if you're dealing with a fossil species, that's morphology is going to be very similar to a likely ancestral reconstruction on some trees. Um, that's going to say we want a divergence time somewhere around that species lifetime. On the other hand, if it's highly derived, um, that means that even under relaxed clock models, we're going to want some amount of time separating it from the divergence from the clades that lead to the modern. Uh, so it's basically going to be applying the clock principle. Now, one thing for those of you who are more old school and used to thinking about clocks as these sort of uh, completely immobile things where we're just, you know, basically using like strict radiometric decay. Um, that is a sort of null model in the clock approaches. There are a variety of ways and these rev base scripts I'm gonna, uh, that are gonna be presented to you uh, are gonna give you a variety of sort of what you can call relaxed clock models in which we're taking into account um, rate heterogeneity on the tree. Uh, but even with rate heterogeneity, uh, 
it's still the, the time factor is going to be important. So let us with that jump to our sort of um, our studio example. Now, I should ask at this point, are there any questions about these basic things that I've introduced? No questions? Thumbs up if you're all happy with no questions. I see thumbs. Thumbs are good. Of course, I can only see a fraction of you. I like the Darwin pick there. All right. So um, another thumbs up. Uh, how many of you were able to download the package that I put on GitHub? I should say how many of you, you know, were able to and, and, and of course, how many bothered you would be sort of the same question because you know, again, it's the classic sampling issue. It's like um, the, the interest unit and the sampling rate. Ooh, not all that many. Oh, well. Um, so what this is going to present for you is in a way, it's going to be just about what you can use the API for in terms of extracting information from the paleobiology database. And that's good. Um, I'm also going to have this set up, so it's going to create basic rev base scripts for you. Now, again, this is a PaleoDB webinar, um, uh, so uh, you know, I'm going to try to put the initial emphasis on that. Uh, the reason why I'm having it do this is because the rev, rev base, much like, say, the paleobiology database, has a pretty steep learning curve, um, and it is one of those many things where um, if you can get some basic working scripts going uh, initially, uh, it becomes much easier to play with it, to sort of figure out what the different commands are doing, but basically just to get started and do initial analyses. And what I really have this set up for when I, when I prepared this uh, was for a course I'm teaching in which I wanted students to sort of pick up on these things, uh, the time that would take to sort of teach them all the nuances of Red Bayes, uh, well, all the nuances that I know, and that's only a small fraction of the nuances that are out there, would have been you know, exorbitant. I just wanted to help them get started. So I'll show you what we, I have set up here. Um, in the R packages, there are some libraries that are called. I don't know that I've gotten all of them. I've gotten all of them that my machine demands to run things. If you don't have them, this install command will put them in. Also, R loves to make strings factors. I absolutely hate that, so I never said that false. It's always hell no, because I, I really want R to understand I hate factors. Um, what I'm gonna do up front as well is set up things for my local directory. Now I have some warning notes whenever I do this. All these directories are set up for directories on my, Pete Wagner's computers. Um, they will do you no good unless you steal one of my computers, and even then I have password protected. You will have to change these to uh, folders that are appropriate for you. This is actually quite useful to do in two, in two parts of this. One, uh, that way the R program is always looking at the folder you want it to be looking at when you're executing this, as opposed to whatever folder it happens to be set up at. But it's also going to set up the folders for the Red Bayes analyses, which are, I've set up differently in its own Red Bayes um, projects folder. And I have this sort of simple partitioning of the data files from the script files, from the output files, just some real simple stuff like that. But the scripts are going to come ready to go with that. So this information is going to be kind of important. I have some external files here, the rev base setup and also historical diversity metrics. And this is sort of the additional kicker. I have some external database files. Now, the PaleoDB will provide you with millions of years, uh, how, how many millions of years old a collection is approximately based on the input stratigraphic unit. There is room for things like zones, but it doesn't actually use them. What I've been doing over the years for my own nefarious purposes is setting up a large database, mostly of Paleozoic stuff because I work with the Paleozoic, uh, with Paleozoic snails in particular, 
Uh, but the idea is it's going to try to pin down the ages of the rock units much more exactly by connecting them, in the case of the Paleozoic world, large in things like conodont zones, graptolite zones. If you were dealing with Mesozoic uh, stuff, it would be ammonites, forams, etc. cetera. Um, I don't know what they do in the Cenozoic. Don't want to know. Kind of weird and kinky up there. Uh, actually, no, it's not true. It's diatoms and stuff like that. I get used as well as the forams. Uh, as I said, this is really focused on the Paleozoic. But it's also something that will show you what other things you can do. Now, back in the early days of the paleobiology database, I actually was there in 1998 in August in a smoky pub in Liverpool, or maybe Santa Barbara, one of the two. And we had this sort of you know, big dream of what we we're going to do. And, and one of it would have been sort of a giant stratigraphic database, kind of like Macrostrat. But that proved to be a bit more, um, well, a bit more than a lot of us could do. We sort of attacked this piece by piece. And as a result, some of the stuff that I began preparing way back then for my own research and possibly to go into the PaleoDB never quite made it there. This external database, the Rock Unit database, is going to provide a lot of that information. The um, <clears throat> is information about superposition, uh, when we have information about zones to which rock units are known, uh, equally important when we know that rock units span multiple zones because uh, that's going to affect the fuzziness of the dates. And as I'll show you in a little bit, that fuzziness is going to be important. I have an amended version of the uh, Grade Scene 2012 scale in here, which also includes a lot of zones that aren't in Grade Scene, which based on, say, papers that look at the correlations among, in, in this particular example we're going to worry about, trilobite zones around the world during the Cambrian. That's going to be really important. And there's also some edits. There are some files that I can't edit because uh, some, some collections that I can't edit because the people who are working on them sort of dropped out and can't give out collection uh, permissions anymore. And we're going to load up these, these uh, external databases because what we're going to do is we're going to read through the PaleoDB for this particular group. And then we're going to try to refine the ages of the collections that include the group in question, the Syncta. They said, uh, for those of you who don't know what they are, they're an early group of echinoderms. Um, they are not pentamerally symmetrical, so they don't have a star shape to them. They're not bilaterally symmetrical anymore, although you can still see vestiges of it. Uh, they're sort of like those weird solute things, but they're not quite there either. Uh, we know they're echinoderms because they have stereome, which is an extremely distinctive uh, mineralogy for, for their plates. Um, but uh, they don't look like echinoderms you're going to see in any aquarium anymore funky things. So this loads up the database. Now what I'm now going to do for the, uh, for the function I'm going to execute is give it some basic information. One, just an analysis thing. Why am I going to do that? Well, there are options for outputting files from the PaleoDB as we go. I'm going to turn that off. I've turned that off for this particular run because it's going to clutter up things. Uh, the relevant files can be our output from the function, or I should say the relative matrices are, and they can be output afterwards. An onset and an end, because right, we're going to ask the PaleoDB for data. It's best if we ask it for relevant data from a particular time interval. Uh, otherwise, you might get the whole damn thing. And that takes a long time. You do not want to do that. And that's something actually I'll discuss um, perhaps at the end, because there are cases when people are going to be wanting to collect this data for groups in which people have sort of done a hodgepodge mix of very old and very young things. Um, and you might want to focus on just the fossil groups. The time scale that I'm going to be using for this, because we're going to be dumping in uh, external database with time scales, there is the classic sort of international or standard one, which has the names you learn in your history of life classes. And, uh, you know, will be the ones that if you're not a paleontologist, you might know, like the Maastrichtian or the um, Aziasian, one of them. Well, that's a finer unit, but I think that's on the international scale. Again, I don't do the Cenozoic. Uh, the Ordovician and the basic subunits thereof. However, we have a lot of regional scales. And this is going to take that into account because, um, uh, well, it's going to allow us to set it up on any scale. What I'm using is something called the stage size. Now, something people started doing in with the order vision. This was largely due to Stig Bergstrom and his colleagues who were working heavily with conodonts and graptolites, which leave quite fine um, biozonation, but also integrating isotope data. Not radiometric isotopes where you're getting radioactive decay, but shifts in carbon-13, carbon-12, and um, 
oxygen, uh, 18O and, and 16O curves. And frequently you're finding you're getting these massive shifts planet-wide, which has huge implications for things like environment, but it's also really good for stratigraphy. Um, and one of the things they wound up doing is taking the uh, standard scale for the order division and dividing it up into slices that were encompassing, say, a couple of conodont zones or a couple of graptolite zones. So finer than the classic stages, um, broader than a general zone. Uh, more recently, uh, Bjorn Kroger and company extended this to the Cambrian. I should say Bergstrom et al. extended it to the Silurian. Um, I sort of did an extension to the Cambrian on my own that was almost identical to what Kroger et al. Uh, did. Uh, and that's what's going to be used here. This is called stage slices. And I've actually got this set up and I just sort of made these up for my own purposes with stage slices from the Devonian through the Permian. And there might be time after that, but I, you know, I don't want to know about it. Not true. A control taxon. What, what do I mean by a control taxon? And again, this is going to be something to me, uh, for those of you coming from the phylogenetics world, is worth knowing. It's the idea of a taphonomic control. Taphonomy is the study of what happens to things after they die and what needs to happen for them to get into the fossil record. Now, there's some basic geological stuff that's more tectonic, like is the rock around anymore? But when we find rocks with fossils in them, frequently many groups are excluded. Obvious cases, worms and jellyfish aren't gonna be there when the clams and snails and brachiopods are. Uh, and that's partly tap on you because that's going to affect soft tissue preservation. But it's much more um, complicated than that. In fact, particular mineralogies tend to be preserved better than others in particular locations. And what we're going to want to know is, here we are. Oops, I didn't mean to hit that button. What we want to know is um, where are we finding echinoderms? We're looking at one particular group of echinoderms, the synctons here. But and when it comes to preservation and when it comes down to the question of, whoops, ah, finally, I've started seeing the chat parts. Yes, uh, by the way, answering question, this is going to be recorded and being posted. Um, and Graham wanted to know what Hell no means that means no, no, make that false under no circumstances. And it's because I'm petty and you know, I, I like to shout at R. In fact, if you ever look at my R packages, if they look like someone shouting C or C++ loudly and slowly at R Studio, that's exactly how I program in R. Um, I'm not one of these hipster elegant types, but we digress. Uh, a control taxon. So what's the issue with this? Uh, we want to know opportunities to find something. Uh, and that is we're, when we find echinoderms, those are going to be our opportunities to find a specific group of echinoderms because you're preserving the right mineralogy. There's another twist with this though. Echinoderms are one of those groups like vertebrates that have multiple elements. And for the most part, to easily identify them, you need a big chunk of the animal to stick together after it died. And again, this is a taponomic effect. Um, so if you're finding localities in which you're finding a lot of fairly articulated echinoderms. These are the places where you could be. Oops, did I stop sharing the screen? I did, I'm sorry. I must have accidentally zapped it off. Apologies there. Screen sharing back. Should be excellent. These are the opportunities to find the echinoderms. There's going to be one parameter in particular for which we're going to need an empirical estimate in advance. And this is going to be the intensity of sampling for the latest members of the group we're looking at. Uh, we can also use this to get an initial estimate that'll be used as a sort of seed by Rev Bayes. I'll explain, Rev Bayes will try to figure it out on its own. But this is the important thing. Um, we need an idea of what other groups are going to represent a sampling control. If we can find this members of this taxon, we should be able to find members of the group in which we are interested. Another parameter we're going to get at are the zone taxa. In the Cambrian, uh, our zonations are based largely on trilobites, which sometimes include the group Agnostida, uh, sometimes do not. I have them separated here because we have taxonomic tables and in the paleobiology database, uh, Mark Ewan has covered these in earlier tutorials. And if the latest opinion sticks all the agnostids in as a sister group to the trilobites, 
I won't get them this way. So I'm just playing it safe. It might be redundant. Uh, I'll have to go see what this week's opinions are. Um, it, uh, but just to play it safe, I'm, I'm including the separate zone taxon. And the Archaeocyatha, what the hell are those, you might ask? They're an extinct group of sponges that are used heavily for biozonation in the first part of the Cambrian. Really, they sort of stop being important right about the time that our study group here, the Cincta, is going to become important. Um, and this is going to be critical because frequently when we get these zone taxa, we're going to be able to tie down the possible age of a rock unit much more exactly than, say, just the Menevian or the Drummian or something like that, which are just names of points of time in the Cambrian. We can tell it what basic environments to look for, marine and unknown, um, obviously. You don't have a lot of terrestrial stuff to look at in the Cambrian anyways, and echinoderms have never made it onto land. Uh, a temporal precision, because when it comes down to trying to refine the possible ages, we're just gonna worry about, say, units of 100,000 years. Now, people have done much finer stuff recently, uh, there's an incredible paper that just came out um, by the, uh, a large working group in China using Pete Stadler's, uh, uh, Pete Stadler's uh, Connaught method, which they were finding dates on Paleozoic uh, beds to like something like 20,000 years or something ridiculous, um, which is just, would be wonderful if we could do that for everything, but we really can't. Um, so I'm just gonna set it at that level. These are some basic things to put in. This is gonna be the big thing, the big command. What we're gonna do is access the paleobiology database information using a Nexus file, the one which has all the information for the sync and all the characters, basically say, I want you to find the information about these taxa. And it's going to run. One thing I would say it's gonna warn you of right off. Um, it's gonna take a Nexus file and it's going to get the occurrences and relevant collections, including that of the zone taxa. It's going to execute some moves from sort of elementary biostratigraphy to try to further refine the dates. I would really stress this should be a starting point for analyses. Um, the paleobiology database has a lot of data, therefore it has a lot of incorrect data or data that you're going to think is incorrect. It's going to be missing a lot of data. Um, when I first got involved with this, I thought I had all of the relevant uh, Ordovician, Silurian, gastropod data in my own database. I discovered, because of other people entering things in the PaleoDB, that really, I was wrong. Um, even when you're an expert on these groups and know a lot about them, you'll be surprised at how much additional stuff you'll be able to learn. And of course, it can be a sort of trail for finding out um, what else you might want to be looking at for your phylogenetic work. So, at this point, what it's asking is, what Nexus file do I want to analyze? And I'm just going to grab this one. And it's getting the taxonomic data. Now, this is going to be important because what it's going to do is take all of those taxa that were in the Nexus file, read them, and it's going to look up our information about them in the PaleoDB. Now, in this case, as I said, I set this up for analyses we were doing for a short course. Uh-oh. What the hell? That shouldn't have happened. Oh, I know what happened. The PaleoDB timed out on me. Do that again. Some days when the PaleoDB isn't very cooperative, it'll time out. Anyways, what this is going to mean is that if you have a lot of taxonomic entry, uh, data in there, all the different combinations, all the different genus species combinations that go with a particular taxon in your matrix. Whoa, what the hell? Um, there's something wrong here, and that was not happening 15 minutes ago. I ran through all of this right beforehand to make sure it was working. I did update this because R just came up with um, R4.0, and I figured there'd be a mix of people who had that and didn't. So I have been recently making sure this is all debugged. Wow. Okay. I literally ran this before we went. 
Well, I'm going to just jump in here. Every person's webinar nightmare. Oops. This will just show you all the stuff that's in here. Um, one thing I do usually recommend is setting the taxon level to species. Even if you're doing a genus level analysis, it will base the ranges solely on the genus, uh, on the uh, occurrences that have ident been identified to species level. And of course, that's important because um, if the genus assignment that species has changed, we can, um, it'll basically can get assigned to, a, to its current genus. If it's just flexicalamine spa, well, you really don't know if it's a species that is currently in flexicalamine or not. So even in these um, analyses that are at the genus level, and a lot of say vertebrate level uh, analyses are, um, it's going to uh, set as a default to use uh, species only. And that, that's going to be the taxonomic level to which it's set. Okay. Oops. Oh, crap. That was the wrong one. Um, also, I use a command, if you haven't seen it before, called file choose, which basically lets you just grab the file and work with it from there instead of uh, importing the name in. Again, that can make it a little bit easier because you don't have to worry about directories and things like that. I'll show you what the bogarted stuff will mean in a little bit. All right. Whoa. I'm afraid what might be happening is that it's not getting in touch with the paleo DB when trying to do part of this, which can happen sometimes, but Wow. Let me check on something up here. Boy, this is nightmarish. I said, what it's doing at these different points is collecting the information. Now it's going through. It must have missed. I must have forgotten to uh, tell it one of the what one of the variables was or something. At this point, it's going to be going through and getting first for about twenty-five different syncton species the collection data, uh, the occurrence and collection data. Now it's doing it for the control. Uh, it did it for the control tax. So it just grabbed all of the chymoderms, and now it's grabbing it for the trilobites, the agnostids and the um, archaeocyathids. And what it's going to do is basically going to be looking to see when we, find, uh, when we find those things in the collections that also had echinoderms. So we're going to be able to use that to refine the stratigraphic dates. And it'll take a few moments to get this. Yeah, here we are. At this point, it's now going to access the external rock unit database. And yep, that's all it was. I forgot to copy in some of the variables in advance. How embarrassing. Um, what it then did is went through and took the rock unit database to get more refined dates on things. And it's going to do one more thing after that. And that gets into sort of an elementary uh, biostratigraphic technique. Uh, what I'm doing is sort of a modified version of what John Alroy presented back in um, uh, 1992. It is conjunct method. So Suppose you have a collection that could be in one of two trilobite zones. 
and that collection has 10 species. Five of them are known from C or D, um, three are known from one or the other. Um, what you can basically do is try, is, uh, sorry, um, three are known from C or earlier and two just don't have any other collections. So basically what we have is a bunch of taxa that are known from C and D, a bunch that are known from only C or earlier than that, and two for which we have no other information. If we assign this particular collection to zone D, what we're gonna need are sort of three range extensions on these taxa. We're gonna have to sort of uh, adjust our idea of the stratigraphic ranges for three taxa to do this. Conversely, if we assign it to zone C, we don't have to do this for any. Now there are more sophisticated ways to do this, and this is uh, conceptually related to the stuff that's in like CONOP and other types of analyses, although they um, are specifically focusing on, on sections. But the methods they use to connect beds across different sections are very similar to this. Uh, one could go with a full-blown conjunct type of analysis on everything and just ignore the dates that the PaleoDB provided. Um, I'm not doing that simply because it would take a very long time. But what it's doing with this is trying to get to the point where you can do that, where you can narrow it down. And what you see here are the bunch of collections that it had. There aren't all that many for this group, is why I wanted to use this example. And we're going to do iterative passes. And we start off with 83 of them that we can put down to a single um, time slice, a single uh, uh, trilobite zone usually. And we can keep going. Uh, keep adjusting things. We can sort of relax the criteria and say, okay, what if it's like a four to one ratio, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually you're going to get to the point where it's going to be like 95 that we can sink into just one. Uh, there are going to be a bunch of uh, collections that might be in one of two or three or even four. That's undesirable, but it's okay because we can take into account this fuzziness in the Bayesian analyses. And versions of Red Bayes that will come in the near future are going to be really designed for that. And we can then output all of this information. Now, this, as I said, is very important to look at and listen to. Oh, that's interesting. That explains why. The text box that I have open is only visible to me if I'm not sharing the screen. So I'll come back uh, and, and turn this off and look for questions in a moment, okay? Um, we're gonna output these files. And this is the part where I really recommend you look at them. Um, at some point. And in fact, if you're doing phylogenetic analyses, you're exactly the sort of person that the PaleoDB wants to have looking at these things for updating taxonomic assignments, seeing if you think the identifications are good, et cetera. And there's a couple of things I want to focus on here. 